Look at you. Look at you. Here they went. It's been so long. How happy pride. Oh, happy pride. Yay. I love but, it. Yeah. Pride for me is more about, you know, just being in your own skin and being happy with who you are. Helping others that aren't there yet. Yeah. Yeah, you sure. do it, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah, it's less about parades for me nowadays, but I do love a good parade. Before the parade. Absolutely. <laughs> so. So. Meet the biz. Yay. <laughs> We already did. Call him again. Put him on speaker. 911, what's your emergency? It's emergency dispatcher Abby Clark, Parker Center. I'm not on site. I need to speak to Stephanie Gaskins and emergency medical dispatch. This is EMD Gaskins. Steph, it's Abby. Abby? I've got an adult male, fully obstructed air pipe. Compressions? Yes, but he's unconscious. I can't remove the object. He stopped breathing two minutes ago. Another three minutes. <sighs> gonna have brain damage. I need you to walk me through an emergency tracheotomy. Abby, have you lost your mind? Come on. You know the paramedics are gonna be at least seven minutes. I can't let this happen. I've gotta do something. You got a knife, something sharp. You're going to need something to keep the airway open, like a pen or a straw. A knife and a, and a pen or a straw, something. Okay. Oh, thanks. Find the indentation between his Adam's apple and the cricoid cartilage. Yep. Okay, I think I found it. But you're going to make a horizontal incision. A half inch wide and about half inch deep. Oh my god. Oh god. Oh god, okay. There shouldn't be a lot of blood, but try to keep it from leaking into his windpipe. Okay, I did it. Okay, stick your finger in, open it up. Oh god. Oh my god. Okay, okay, okay. Get the pin in there. Two quick breaths. Five seconds. Four, three, two. Another quick breath. Excuse me, excuse me, Granny coming through. It's okay, it's okay. It's okay. Granny coming through. I love in this business, in this world of entertainment, how you know you meet someone years and years and years ago and God, it sounds like I'm old <laughs> <laughs> but I I'm still young and fresh <laughs> very fresh very fresh very fresh I you know it's just interesting how you can meet somebody years ago and and you just keep knowing them and they, they, they truly become part of the family and your family, their family, all the families come together and you grow with them. And then you don't speak to them for a little while, but then you connect and reconnect. And it's like, nothing, time hasn't gone by. It, yeah. it, yeah, truly is family. And yeah, uh, absolutely. Right. You know, that voice, by the way, is our special guest today. Um, and she has done, just really, I mean, she's amazing in so many aspects of her life, and she's an actress. She's been on 911, Drunk History, um, the new movie that just came out, I Saw Problems. She was on Speechless. You know, I could keep on going. The beautiful, the wonderful Alice Kina Deal. Oh, oh. <laughs> I won't stand up and clap because I can't, but. Yay! How nice introduction, you? sir. Oh, how are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm, you know, I got my little cup with my ginger ale. <laughs> Yay. I don't have any cups, but I'm sure I'll find a cup later in the hour. Okay. First of all, I love your room. Uh, this is my VHS layer. So this is kind of like my film study. And I grew up with VHS. It's my first love. And uh, I didn't have a lot of money a few years ago. And one of the things that my wife and I used to do mm -hmm. is we'd go every week to her store 
just a it's just something to do and we always had pocket change so and then i i realized that it's like you know this whole begotten era of vhs tapes and i just went hog wild and now it's like the collection i always dreamed of it's wonderful it's so wonderful i mean yeah i just i'm looking at it and all these movies that i love and and have seen and and there's cujo Oh my God, D. Wallace. D. Wallace is one of my heroes. Oh my God. As you know, she's family as well. Yes. So she's yes. in our little, our, I, I, yeah, it's a goal of mine to be on that stature of D. Wallace. Well, Daniel Harris. Again. We, should, we should all have like a party with D. That would be fun. Yeah. Yeah, she's I, taught me the biz like, I don't know, four or five. I, don't, I, I lose track. Of course, I always liked your classes, of course, but I would probably say D and um, uh, Lady Kazan were my favorites, uh, just because given their body of work, you know, they were so accessible and they were so willing to teach and right. just, you know, that's great. Yeah. That's what you uh, want. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I could still, I could we could do a whole episode just on on your room and the things that I see in it because it's so something that I could just jump into and hang out on your couch next to the pillow. Well, yeah, no, you're you're more than welcome to come over here anytime. Now that we're all vaccinated, let's do it up. I think so. We'll have a movie party, an all night long <laughs> movie party. Oh yeah, no, I I could stay here all day, but you know, I I have a marriage to attend to as well. Of course. Well, yeah, you know. I, I do have to say, I mean, talking about being in the entertainment industry and you being an actress, I mean, you were the winner of the first annual John Ritter Scholarship, right? Yeah, for young actors with disabilities. That's what really was the big catalyst to getting me and my family to move down here to pursue everything as far as film and television. Right. But before all that, I started in theater. I grew up in a small snow town in Northern California and uh where where that was uh calaveras county okay okay yeah yeah i'm, well, I'm I, well, from I grew, arnold Pel i grew up in um uh san mateo county oh so we're not that far okay so yeah small town people and i grew up in, in theater i originally wanted to play baseball for the san francisco giants uh, that was my first i wanted to do that but you know obviously given my physicality um I, I couldn't do that. And then I got into skiing and my, my parents were very athletic. Yeah. So I got into adaptive skiing. And then really, I really took to acting when I was about five, mainly because I watched movies. Uh, the television and the VHS was, you know, my babysitter on the days that I couldn't do as much, yeah. which were often. Mm -hmm. So, but I never felt like it was wasted time you know, ever. I was always lost in all the different actors and why they made the movie and how they made the movie. And that's how I started with acting. And um, I would do about three plays a year. And I was pretty, I would get a lot of local press and I was pretty well known. Right. And then that's when I got given the scholarship because I was, I was doing so many plays at that time. I love that. And that was just wild because <clears throat> i remember of course everybody knows john everybody i mean for me I, I grew up watching problem child those are the films that i watched with him in and so particularly problem child 2 was my favorite right out of that bunch and um i remember he had passed on and it was i remember that being such a shock that he had just that how how it happened and how sudden it was um, I remember my best friend being really distraught because she had grown up on Three's Company reruns and all that stuff. And I watched this uh, documentary about him and it was not only did he just seem like the most genuine man, you know, such a sweetheart, but his brother has cerebral palsy, his brother, Tom. And they actually, the Ritters actually started United Cerebral Palsy oh yeah so and i was watching this going oh my god you know i wish i had met this guy what a great person yeah. and then 
two, uh, like a week or two later, I got given the call that he had donated some money to Media Access, yeah. which was a government-run program. As you know, that's how we met to try and get actors with disabilities out there. And I, that was such a huge thing, you know. And uh, it just really kind of solidified. Okay, this is your next step. This is what you're supposed to do. And I moved one month after I graduated. So I moved out here at 18 in 2005. Wow. I remember when you got that award. You do? I do. I remember. That Jason, his son gave it to me and uh, Joe Montana was there because they were on a show at the time together. And um, wow. yeah, it, and then I think I, no, that wasn't the night that I met Stevie Wonder, but I also met Vern Troyer that night. And it was just, those, those were such fun times because I think, you know, Mini Access, the awards are kind of closed now. And I miss that because everybody used to go, you know, it was like a big family reunion and you'd also get to meet some stars as well, you know? Right. I was so, looking through your, your pictures online and I saw that one beautiful one of you and Stevie. Oh my God. What I love about that picture, I mean, I mean, huge Motown fan. I grew up on Motown and Stevie and all that. But um, yeah, that moment was amazing. It was like literally being greeted by a real life angel. That's what it felt like. Cause he had that same kind of presence, just really fun and playful yeah. and his shape too. He's a big guy. Right. Yeah, he's just tall. But the, the thing I love about that picture the most is my mom's smile. She's just- uh through the roof your mom's smile is i mean yeah. I, I i love seeing her when, whenever she would come to class or whenever i would see her at events and yeah and again when i looked at that picture there there you were with her yeah and my i'm glad you mentioned my my parents and my mom and you know being disabled um it's it's you have to have a community and, and um, you know, a lot of us are what some, you know, are dependent on others to, to do stuff. So, you know, like acting and going to auditions and stuff like that, that, that used to be a real chore. Yeah. So it's real important to have, you know, support, whether it's a family that you're born into or like a family like us. Right. I wouldn't be able to do all the stuff I do without my wife and my family helping me along. Like I had an audition today and um, we were looking up, we, I always look up what to wear. Like if, if I have an idea of what the audition actually is, right. I'll look up previous ones and, and look up what to wear and all that stuff. And then, so my wife helps me get ready and all that stuff. It's a real group effort to do what we do. So if, if I, you know, get an audition or if I book something, I consider it a, a, a team win, you know? Yeah. yeah. You are oh, such an open really book. Can. You're so, oh, that looks good. I should get some of that. I should yes. start drinking water rather than ginger ale, but. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I love ginger ale. Uh, I'm, I'm with you on that. Yeah. It's sort of the cleanest of the, uh, you know, sodas. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Now you're talking, like I mentioned, you're such an open book and it feels just to flow, just to be you is, is what makes you so wonderful. Like you were talking about your wife and how does that, how, where did you both meet? Okay. So we actually met on Plenty of Fish before it kind of went downhill. So online dating and uh, I was on there for two years. Right. Homegirl was on there for 30 minutes. <laughs> And she knew a good thing when she saw it. Woo! So, okay, yeah, that was almost eight years ago now. Eight years ago now, at least. Really? Oh. I know, time flies. Yeah, and uh, she has multiple sclerosis, so, and I have cerebral palsy. So we, even though our disabilities are different, they're kind of similar in how we affect each other. They, it affects us. And, right. and uh, yeah, there's just disabled love is beautiful. That's for sure. 
You know, I, I have a bunch of questions written down and I, I want to get to them all, but I'm just going with the flow of where we're going, which I usually yeah. do, sort of like taking a ride at Disneyland. Um, Absolutely. Let's go with the flow. Uh, by going, oh, this is the, the, the thought that came to my mind. As you get more and more doing more and more work and you get to that point where you're, you know, people are seeing you on the screen all the time, or even now, what do you want people to learn? What do you want humanity to learn? If you had to teach one thing to, to society or the world, what would it be? That there's nothing wrong with being disabled at all. It's, it's something that we all encounter and yet it's, there's such deep shame in it. And that's because we belong to a capitalist society where the measure of a person's worth is how much you can get done in a day. Mm. And I don't believe in that. I feel like you're a human being on this earth. You're good enough. We're all connected to it. You're in no way a stranger to this place. We all have something to give and offer. It's up to you to, it's up to you to figure that out though, what that is. Mm -hmm. And but uh, yeah, there's absolutely nothing wrong with being disabled. What's wrong is, is, is not making sure that we're given all the accessible, accessible lifestyle that we need. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what's wrong. But you're not wrong. You're not broken. You're, it, it's, it's part of being human. So. Right. Everybody has different it, it, parts of themselves and everybody is their own person right and and it's um you know i was hearing that and you know i was thinking about you know we think about pain um whether it's a physical pain or a mental pain and it it seemed like the acceptance can be a, a the acceptance of a person whoever they are whether they're gay they're straight they're they have a disability they're you know uh, I don't know what they have. They've had a heart attack. The acceptance of people, people have issues with that for some reason. And it, it seems to be more painful sometimes than actual physical pain. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, you know, uh, um, people with CP, for example, I think more than half of us experience depression. Um, and that could be from the brain injury itself that I, I, you can acquire or it can also be, you know, circumstantial because again, we were disabled living in an ableist world. Mm. And it's like, well, how do you, that seems too big and it's not too big. It could be, you could just take small steps of letting people know, you know, what they could do to change mm. or getting your voice out there. Um, you know, it's, I have a huge uh, or a pretty big Instagram following for medical cannabis. I'm also known as Rolling Stoned. And I remember when I first started that, I was like, I just, you know, I record videos on my phone. That's how I do it. And I remember like, oh, people want to hear this. People want to know. No. And I'm open your own shop. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And website and all, and YouTube and the whole nine. Yeah. But, you know, at first, uh, you know, I remember thinking, oh, people, people don't really care. You'd be surprised. It's important to to get your voice out there however you can. Well, it's interesting you're talking about your voice because when you did grow up, that when we were back in the day when you're up in Northern California, you had your own cable access sh show. So you had that voice, you know, probably when you popped out of the womb. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I was, well, that's why I was born three months early because I, I had all this stuff to do and say and try, you know, right. absolutely. But no, I did. Alice's Flicks, Picks and Kicks. Again, that was me reviewing movies, talking about, you know, and it was the best thing, you know, for a kid in, in middle school because the payment was free rental and uh, movie tickets. So that I hit the jackpot as far as I was concerned at the time. Do you have any so, of this on tape? Oh yeah, oh yeah, I totally do. And it's really bad, <laughs> but you know, but you know, I think it's really bad, but you probably think, you know, everybody else would probably say it's, it's adorable, but I'll have to poke some out because I have them in here 
and then I'll I'll post them so you can see. Oh. Yeah, so that's how it started. But yeah, my love of movies has has all, and I've written for Rue Morgue in the past, which is a horror magazine in Canada. And so, I mean, it, you know, that love of film has, has never left me. Well, that's the thing, too. I know that you're a huge fan of horror. Yeah, huge uh -huh. fan, of it, which is why D. Wallace is, is a big deal to me. Yeah. And uh, the funny part about that is I'm glad we're talking about D because... Uh, I grew up with Robert Conrad so much so that he was like my uncle yeah. you know he really kind of he looked he wasn't the greatest human being but yeah. if he liked you he would treat you like you were solid gold and um not that I got into acting he he took it very serious and he'd come to all my plays and right he ended up doing a show there in our hometown and D. Wallace was a part of it. And I wasn't into acting at the time. I was really young. Yeah. And uh, she sat down next to me and my mom. And she pulls out this really old makeup bag. And I go, well, that's, that's an old big makeup bag you got there. She goes, yeah, I've had it since I was the mom on ET. And I went, of course, you should know that I have about seven original et tapes it's my favorite ah. tape favorite film of all time oh, wow. and uh, i said of original ones or all different ones? oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah baby so one day i'll maybe i'll cash in on a couple of them but not all ah, i love it and uh and i said you were the mom on et she goes yeah i'm d nice to meet you kiddo and yeah um I wasn't really in the scene. I didn't know what I was doing. She's like, oh, you know, you don't talk. You just watch me walk. And then I walk off camera and that's it. So she's kind of teaching me like what to do and where to look and all that stuff. And I think at the last couple of takes or whatever, she, she rubbed my head so you could see me on camera. So my first ever on film scene when I was a little kid was with Dee. And so now the fact what that again? With my first on-camera scene is with Dee when I was a little girl. And was it a, it was for a movie? No, it was for um, Bob Conrad's. Um, right, right. Uh, searching, Bob Conrad's, like, it's High Mountain Rangers, I think. Okay. That's what they called it. We always called it Bob Conrad's Search and Rescue, but that's not what it was. It was High Mountain Rangers, I think. So, yeah, and uh, they, they played, um, like, a bunch of, like, snow EMTs, basically. And, uh, but yeah, so to actually get to know her really as an adult through your classes was a really wonderful full circle moment, you know, and now we're, whenever we see each other, we remember each other, but right. yeah. I, you know, it's interesting to hear that story because I didn't know that you had met Dee before and, and to hear that complete story makes me go, oh, because I just do these I do love yeah. this because I enjoy it and I want and even more than that I want I love connecting people so yeah. to hear that story and how it's like how it came full circle in a way is yeah magic mean magic and mean it, it even fills me up more um yeah because it just shows you that I was supposed I was in the right place right. I was supposed to be with you and D and acting and what I've always done right um, you know, and I'm connecting to, to, you know, your cable access show and what made me think of like a cable access was creature features with Bob Wilkins. Oh, Bob <laughs> Wilkins is a hero, is a hero. I love And that, that. was, and I have to, have to say, you know, you would always end each, uh, show with, uh, uh, watch war films, make America strong again. And to be honest, I was scared out of my gourd when COVID came down because I have a lot of medical trauma from being disabled myself. Yeah. So it was basically like the culmination of all my fears, you know? And sure enough, I was like, well, I, you know, I could definitely just sit down for a year and watch Netflix. It's what I do most of the time anyway. And I, and I subscribed to Shudder. And I don't know what it was, but 
you know, I, I watch more horror than I have <laughs> ever, and I'm a, and I'm a horror writer, right? You know, but it it made me feel safer, and I think that's what horror that's what I love about horror the most is it's a safe outlet for all your fears. Um, you, you know, maybe you could put something on that's even scarier than COVID to help you cope. You know, and when they're done correctly it's a social justice call or something mm. usually like get out like get out us those are more modern ones but i also you know cujo for example is is not about is not just about a scary dog it's about a, a relationship that's falling apart you know and uh mm. her having to deal with cheating on her husband and you know the fact that I think the boy is more attached to the dad than the mom. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how that affects them as they're trying to escape this big scary dog. You know, you know, and I'm hearing this too. When you said, you know, I, you know, here is this big thing called COVID, and it's like horrific. And so, where do you run to? You run to horror films, which is. Which is amazing. The way you described it was a healing. Where you know, for me, I do love horror films, but for that, during during the last year, I've stayed away from horror films because yeah, most I, people said the same thing. Yeah, I feel like I was living one, but so I went to more meditation and more Zen and all that. Same, same. Yeah. But I mean, I used to collect horror soundtracks. I know, I know. We taught we I I. Uh, do you have any left? Because I would love to oh. compare notes. Oh yes, I, and you know I have, I have the albums. Yeah, I have the Howling. Um, <laughs> I have, and one day I'm going to go to D's and say, "Can you sign this?" <laughs> because oh, I no, totally. I don't usually ask for autographs and all that. I think I've asked for two in my whole life, and one of them was to Corey Allen, <laughs> which you know Fair. you, you Fair. Know. we. We were, I worked with Corey Allen, all my buddies, we did a, we did a wonderful, like half non-disabled, half disabled cast of A Christmas Carol. Yeah. And can I just say how special of an experience that was? Because it never happened again. Hmm. And, it, and it, you know, it's kind of few and far between that you have multiple people, you know, especially in theater, we need to talk about the inaccessibilities of theater and how that should change mm -hmm. because that's one of the reasons why I only do film and television is because I feel like stage is, is incredibly hard for people with disabilities. Not only the time that you put in, but the accessibility as well. Right. God, that was, you know, now that you mentioned that too, you know, I know to, uh, to produce that was Again, it's one of these things you just do. I mean, being with yeah. Corey and, 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 and doing something like it was in a way ahead of its time in a certain way. It was, and it's, yeah. And it was never done again. And it was just, I don't know. And, and some of the people that were involved, of course, aren't here. Lucy Hagen, who I love and Corey and, you know, it's just a really special. And again, they paired me and Andy because we're, we're two peas in a pod, we're two unicorns. Yes, you so. are. I remember you, you know, auditioning and you would be there at the same time at times. And it was like, you did seem like a brother and sister kind of thing. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, or you know, don't, it, don't you feel like, it, uh, like gay, gay marriage or not? I know yeah, no, he's my gay husband. I'm going to put oh, that out right now. Husband. Yeah, I'm his, I'm his lesbian wife. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's a, like you said, it's another connection. I mean, him and I were very, very close at one point, but then, you know, work and, and uh, you know, life and all that stuff. But again, when we see each other and, and work together, it's like no time has passed. Yeah. Family. Wow. So. I want to get back to the what you have done. You know, you, we grow up, we watch these movies. I mean, I used to love what I had. I, I think I... Well, we will have to compare how many VHS tapes I used to have. I got rid of a lot of them, but, um, and also the horror. But you went on to manifest your horror by, by also being in uh, uh, The Reign of Terror, Haunted House. 
Yeah, I really did. Um, that actually, I mean, go back a few steps. So yeah. when I first came to Hollywood, I was expected to do great. I mean, like I said, I was had my own cable access show. I did three plays a year. Bing, bang, boom. The John Ritter Scholarship. Hey, you know, I'm thinking this is it. I'm going to be on Disney in no time, baby. <laughs> no. Yeah. Able, able, yeah, ableism was really bad then. Yeah. And I would maybe get like two auditions a year. And it was very disheartening. I was pissed pissed mm. and so i got as many tattoos as i could because that's what i wanted and dyed my hair and figured out that i was an advocate for the lgbt community and the disability community and medical cannabis community i had to figure out who i was not just an actor not just a film geek that loved films but who i was as a person i think when did you know that when did you feel like you were a part of the lgbt community when did that sort of went oh I realized when I was 13, but it terrified me at the time because I just didn't want to be both, you know, the disabled girl and the gay girl, you know, there wasn't, and nobody talked about it even then still, you know, um, people need to realize that, that we've come so far in just like five or eight years, you mm -hmm. know, um, yeah and i didn't and i didn't come out until i was about 19 after i moved here and it took you know it was hard because i was dating a guy at the time and that was tough but sometimes that's what it takes is for you to go oh okay things are getting serious now i gotta figure out who i am yeah so i really didn't think that i was ever going to get back into acting which sounds crazy, right? With the legacy that I have and right. all, all that. And, um, and then I met my wife and I realized that, um, you know, they had never seen me act and that really hurt me, you know, that there was this person below my life that had never known that side of me, you know? And so I decided to, to get back into it. I called Gail and I said, and she picked up the phone and she goes, hi, stranger. And I said, hi. And uh, I said, well, do you mind if I audition for you if you have any open spots or anything? And she's like, I'll take you on. And I said, oh, okay. And again, like no time has passed. And I've known Gail since I was 15, so. Well, it's so here. true because I mean, when I first met you, I mean, you were like, whoa, this girl can act. And, and then seeing you in the last, year to two years when you're on 911 and uh, you know whatever roles you're doing the drunk history that uh, whatever you're doing i see you and i go whoa it's like you 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 got your game on you know yeah i'm having fun i just wanted to play that's it i just wanted to play i i don't of course i i want the bigger stuff like what's happening for my my great buddy nicole and i'm so happy for her, her and i are turned out to be college buddies. Again, another connection, family. You were in college and, together? Yeah, we went to call, more for our college for a short while. And, and then- we did, we did plays together. So it's crazy that we would act alongside each other. And now that we're, we're but we're doing other bigger things with Maysoon and Maysoon and Zayed and right. stuff like that. So that's really exciting. Uh, I think uh, that's uh, gonna go somewhere I mean, it's big. It's interesting how you're all connecting. You're connecting with, May soon, and then and then you did the, the Toby, uh, Nicole, and I've known Toby just as long. So you could really finally see the players that have always been here finally start to to come in. And they say it takes a long time. It's not something that necessarily is going to happen overnight. You know, it, it does. And I hear those stories, and I'm like, oh, shut up. Ah. You know. <laughs> good for you but you know unless it's someone I really love and then I'm just like this is great you know I'm I'm all I'm about raising each other up I'm never about like oh my god that you know because I can tell you that me and Nicole have auditioned for the same roles all, all the roles she's got now are roles that I've auditioned for right and now and, you're special together yeah and and that was our first on-screen time and uh it was it was special. It was amazing. Wow. 
after all that time, that was our first on-screen time. And so I think the universe is starting to get it. They need to cast both of us, not just one or the other. Right. Both of us is where the real magic will happen. I could see that happening. You yeah. Got- oh, it's it's going it with May soon and everything. It's going to happen. Absolutely. But that's the point. We all need to do it together, not just one person out to get it all. the children of Arcadia. Please welcome Jason Brittany. Uh, I, I know my father supported the mission of the Media Access Office, and I know he understood the meaning and the purpose of these awards. And I know he would have understood the ambition, desire, and excitement that these young performers have in them. And so thank you for honoring his memory in a way that will continue to inspire young actors in the future. Right. Our Northern California recipient of the John Ritter Young Performer Scholarship is Alice Deal. Mm-hmm. She is a high school junior who is active in the drama department productions as well as local theater. She has produced her own movie review program on cable access for over two years. So please welcome the host of Alice's Flicks, Pinks, and Kicks. Thank you, Joe. Oh my god, Joe my <laughs> That's crazy. Um, First, uh, real quick, I'd like to thank Media Access, especially the North Side, Mr. Doug Gordy, for taking me under your wing. I'm a youngin', so thanks for taking care of me. Um, and then, second of all, my hero, Mr. John Ritter, aka Jack Trippa. Um, and I wear this button, I made this button. It's a picture of John Ritter in his younger days, probably for his company days. He, I'm sure you guys all had the pleasure of laughing with him, crying with him. I wore this button to remember him. And then I got the opportunity to meet the wonderful Jason Ritter and to meet all these people that were touched by him. And I'm thinking, I'm wearing this button to remember him? He's one of these people that's too hard to forget. And I just wanted to say, on behalf of my other co-recipient, Logan, Thank you, John. I love you. I will use this well. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. Southern California.